Gene, really good to see you. Oh, great seeing you again, man. So, Phoenix Project, I grew up learning about DevOps by reading the <laughs> Phoenix Project is the honest answer. Um, but I'm curious, what have you learned since you wrote the Phoenix Project? The Phoenix Project came out in 2013. So that is six years ago. And I cannot overstate how much I've learned since then. In fact, I consider myself lucky on a daily basis that <laughs> you know, people can read it and uh, not be thinking, oh my gosh, he obviously didn't know about X, Y, and Z. Uh, so I would say if I there's the top three things that I've learned since the Phoenix Project came out, one is just how much data it, there is that suggests how much high performers outperform their non high performing peers. And one of the best measurements is code deployment lead time. In other words, how long does it take to go from code being put into version control through integration, through testing, through deployment so that customers are actually getting value? And high performers uh, can do it in minutes, worst case hours, whereas lower performers might take weeks, months, or quarters. And so that's based on uh, five, six years of benchmarking uh, with Dr. Nicole Forsgren, Jez Humble, across 30,000 respondents. Uh, and so the reason I share that is that I think when we wrote the Phoenix Project, that was a speculation. <laughs> and that's, that's really shown very decisively in the data. I think the, the second thing I've learned is just the uh, importance of the leader. Um, one of the strongest signals and predictors of performance in the benchmarking was this transformational leader that exhibited five things. Do they understand the vision of the organization? Uh, do they have intellectual stimulation? In other words, can they question uh, basic assumptions of how we do work? Are they great at inspirational communication, supportive leadership, and uh, uh, personal recognition? Those are all learnings uh, that came you know, even after the Phoenix Project came out. That's fascinating. I can relate to all of those, but particularly in the CXO conference today, I could relate to the metric that two and a half percent of time end to end <laughs> is spent on actual development. And that's just hugely inefficient. So uh, we're both referencing the work of Dr. McKirsten in his book, Project to Product. And I, that was such a revelation to read. And I loved this example of uh, Nokia back in 2006, where you know they were hiring uh, hundreds of developers uh, to uh, get parity with uh, you know, the potential new smartphones coming out. And uh, Mick made this claim that they could have hired, you know, they could have had 20 times the number of developers and it wouldn't have changed the outcome. Mm. And I think it really does show the value of architecture. To what extent does the architecture allow small teams to be able to develop, test, and deploy value to customers independently uh, without having to interact with five, 10, 50 different teams uh, without having to communicate and coordinate to prioritize, sequence, marshal. Right? And these are all the things that uh, slow teams down. And in the case of Nokia, it wasn't just a productivity issue or an efficiency issue. This, this was a, arguably the existential risk that they never uh, adequately faced. As true as this is, and as widely prevalent DevOps is across organizations, the irony still is that most large enterprises have projects that define product development um, and, and mix book and thesis around product development, ongoing continuous product development as opposed to stop start projects yeah. um, is very true, but very prevalent still in most enterprises. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, the, what I've been working on this year and for the last three years is a book called The Unicorn Project. So that's the Phoenix Project retold, but through the eyes of a developer and an architect. And I think the goal is really to try to capture the stories coming out of the DevOps enterprise community, where it is a story almost of rebellion. <laughs> it's a, a small group of people uh, trying to overthrow the older ways of working, often representing very powerful orthodoxies, including project management, <laughs> right? And it takes a very special leader, you know, to be able to understand the goals of the organization, but are willing to break the rules <laughs> in order to help the organization survive. So do you think, um, Gene, large organizations across industries can transform themselves without having a rebellion or a revolution? Yeah. I think all of the DevOps enterprise stories are essentially rebellions. And what has intrigued me is so many of them have been promoted so many times that they are now in charge of uh, the empire. <laughs> right? yes. And so they're being tasked with elevating developer productivity, not just for that small group, but uh, for the enterprise as a whole. What I think makes this work so important is the majority of economic value is not created in the fangs, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Googles. As much value as they've created, that will be dwarfed 
by the economic value that's created when all those practices are adopted by the largest brands and across every industry vertical. And so, you know, if we can elevate every one of those 18 million developers on the planet to be as productive as if they were at a Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, that will generate trillions of dollars of economic value per year. So I think it's inevitable that it, those practices will uh, go across, you know, our entire technology field. And one of the a realities of several large businesses that are transforming themselves is that they are not full of free cash. They are in, in economic cycles that are not booming. And so how do boards get convinced to get on this journey of digital transformation to continuously iterate and improve mm. of customer experiences in a world where they don't have money and they, are, are, they don't have the luxury of making many bits yeah oh what a great question I, I think one i think there's two parts of that one is i think they need evidence that uh this isn't a suicidal uh crazy idea and the reason the devops enterprise community is so interesting and valuable to me is that they are creating proof points showing that these things these practices are working across every industry vertical uh not just every industry vertical in the commercial areas, but also uh, not-for-profits, government agencies like DWP and HMRC. I mean, those are inspirational, wonderful stories about how they change the lives of their consumers, their citizens. And then I think the other challenge that emerges is essentially that technology leader needs the full buy-in and trust of their business counterpart. And uh, what I'm so delighted about us being able to spend time today with is actually getting those triples of technology leaders business leaders and financial leaders to be able to compare notes and uh, uh, teach each other how to better make that case. So Gene, when organizations get on this journey, how do you build and sustain trust in teams? Yeah, there's a really interesting scene in the Phoenix Project where it's all about how do you sort of create um, trust um, within a team, and that's based on the fantastic work of uh, Patrick Lencioni and who wrote the book Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I think in the realm of digital transformation, it gets even uh, more urgent. Uh, just like the Phoenix Project had the three ways, um, the four types of work. In the Unicorn Project, we're using the five ideals as a way to sort of you know, have a way to describe these kind of necessary conditions. And one of them is about silo centrism versus customer centrism. Uh, in other words, in the first case, we have we care only about our process. We have a very parochial view. The process is the end, <laughs> uh, the end goal, um, uh, and we care more about a silo achievements than you know ultimately the you know what the silo is there for. On the other side, it's all about the customer, right? Uh, and I think one of the common themes we've heard was the need to delight the customer, meet those customer needs, understand those needs. I think that's a very exciting lens uh, to sort of view. Now, where are the people, uh, where are company resources being applied to? Uh, is it to f further fund the silo or is it really towards helping achieve those customer goals? Yeah, one of the things I've learned uh, from one of my colleagues who's the global consumer CEO um, is being obsessed about customers is very different as a culture in the organization. Mm -hmm. And the parallel for me is watching Silicon Valley CEOs who are obsessed about their idea, and that's how they scale out from being a startup. And similarly, it's fascinating to watch and to work with colleagues who are obsessed about doing the right thing by the customer rather than being trapped in internal functions and silence. Yes, for me that was such an exciting discovery uh, because when we talk about the customer, a certain and, and ask the question, is this something a customer would pay us for? <laughs> yeah, uh, there are so many things that we do in our daily work where the answer is so clearly no. <laughs> and uh, I think for me, that's uh, just a brilliant way of uh, dividing um, things into customer value or customer non-value, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, Gene, thank you for spending time with us. One of the things I always walk away with, and I won't embarrass you too much, is your humility and your ability to learn constantly. And I'm reminded of a quote, which is which I have thought of often when I look at people I want to learn from, mm. which is the smartest people are not those who know everything, but those who know that they don't know everything and they <laughs> learn at a pace. And you are such an inspirational example. Thank you.